Welcome to your 11th chapter on differential equations and proofs in the logical foundations of cyber-physical systems textbook, where we will be continuing the remarkable shift in perspective toward a more thorough investigation of the wonders of continuous dynamical systems aspects of CPSs. By advancing the logical induction techniques for differential equations that we saw in the previous chapter from differential invariant terms to differential invariant formulas. In other words, we will not just be worrying about the real value of a term that does not change as a differential equation is evolving, but instead worrying about the true value of a formula that does not change as we're following a differential equation. And that's, of course, a lot more general because even if, for example, the real value that a term, say x squared plus y, has as we're following a differential equation is changing, it can very well still be the case that the sign that it has, for example, in the logical formula x squared plus y is equal to equal zero, that sign is not changing. So the true value of the formula remains true, even if the value of the real term itself does not stay 75, say. And we will also be looking at a differential equations twist of Gerhard Gensen's cut principle to obtain differential cuts and then subsequently use them in properties of proving differential equations. Why are we doing this? Well, because the differential invariant proof rule and the differential invariant axiom we saw previously was for very general differential equations, but limited to just proving that post conditions of the form E equals zero, so a term is always zero, are true. That's a very general differential equation, but it isn't a very general post condition at all. Contrast this with what the solution axiom was able to do. It didn't really work for many interesting differential equations because it was only possible when they can be solved in closed form and on top of that solved in closed form that's expressible in first real arithmetic. So, you know, mostly that gives you polynomials and, or maybe rational functions, for example, from nilpotent linear differential equation systems. But at least the solution axiom was perfectly capable of handling any arbitrary post condition quite unlike our differential invariant axiom that we saw so far. So what we will be working toward is generalize the differential invariant proof rule to handle much more general logical post conditions without giving up on the flexibility that it gave us over the axiom for solutions. The core of our new and improved differential invariant proof rule will still be that we're using the differential E prime of the terms that are involved in the quantities that we will investigate in a logical way in order to determine whether, you know, the locally the formulas remain true. But the point is that is much more challenging to apply such, you know, ultimately derivative type invariant reasoning for formulas than it is for terms. So, for example, invariant terms already were surprisingly subtle, remember last time, but ultimately at least they related in very simple, sound, and completely well-defined ways the differential of a term to the very intuitive concept of a time derivative of the value as you know, some kind of rate of change along a differential equation. But what would you do if we were now talking about a time derivative for a formula that we would be catching? Well, what is a time derivative of a formula? Its values aren't 7 and 22 and pi, but its only values are the true values, true or false. And you know, in derivatives of terms, you can clearly understand you know, the derivatives as the question how the function changes its value in the reals at very close by points, but it's not very obvious at all, to say the least what a close by value would be if you're talking about the values of formulas which are only true and false. It's not very meaningful to say the true value of a formula changes just a little bit when the state changes its value just a little bit along the differential equation because, well, there is no other true value other than true or false. 
unfortunately, these considerations almost already send us on our way. This chapter, for those reasons, continues to be of absolutely central significance for the foundations of cyber-physical systems in everything but the most elementary CPSS. So what will we be learning? On the modeling and control side, we will continue to develop a better and deeper understanding of how the continuous dynamical behavior affects the truth of logical formulas. And also we will again be doing this via relating discrete and continuous dynamics. This chapter is still big on computational thinking ideas, where we will find and identify surprising analogies between discrete dynamics and continuous dynamics and use that in, in order to enable rigorous reasoning about differential equations in CPS models, with the point being that we can now soon do this with much more arbitrary logical formulas as post conditions. Um, in particular, we will worry beyond differentially invariant terms and to differential invariant formulas. We will also generalize Gerhard Gensen's cut principle, which is of absolutely seminal significance in discrete logic, to differential equations, thereby continuing our axiomatization of differential equations. And understand in more detail the differential facet of the logical trinity. While the focus on this chapter is on the computational thinking side and reasoning side, on the CPS skill side, there's still a beneficial side effect that we will develop a better intuition for the operational effects in CPSs by understanding how the state changes while the system follows differential equation, and in particular also what properties of the system will not change even if the state itself is changing. Remember the differential facet of the logical trinity of syntax, semantics, and axiomatics, where syntax defines the notation, semantics defines what carries meaning and what real or mathematical object it stands for, while axiomatics is internalizing semantic relationships into universal syntactic transformations. We will continue to investigate the differential part of this logical trinity. Today, for questions, for example, we will understand how the semantics of E equal E tilde relates to the semantics of E minus E tilde equal zero, syntactically justified from the semantics, and then understand how to, that relates to um, what the semantics is, are related to one another as soon as derivatives are occurring. So let's get going to develop full differential invariance. Recap. What we've seen is the fundamental role of what happened when we officially in allowed differentials in the syntax of differential dynamic logic, where for any term e, the differential e prime is allowed as well and stands sort of intuitively for the rate of change, but only for the rate of change along a differential equation, whereas its actual semantics in an isolated state omega is defined as the spatial derivative. So it's a sum over all variables where we're taking the partial derivative of the value of e with respect to a variable x at the state and multiply it with the value that the direction or co-state x prime has at that moment. And that overall is a spatial derivative, which is always acceptable, even if a time derivative at that moment would not be well-defined because all we've got is a single isolated state. But we use these differentials for some good that are added to the syntax and given in semantics by, for example, understanding that very familiar axioms are true about these differentials. The axioms that, for example, relate the differential of a term that happens to be a sum of e plus k to the term that is a sum of the differential of e plus the differential of k. And yes, the two are equal, and we saw that, and um, accept that it is an axiom. In fact, one that we will prove slightly more carefully a minute from now. Also, the Leibniz rule as an axiom that the differential of e times k is the differential of e times k plus e times the differential of k. The differential of a constant is zero because, well, they don't change their value as the variables change because, well, constants just don't simply have any variables. And the differential of a term that happens to be a variable is just exactly described by the corresponding differential symbol or differential variable x prime. We also remember that 
where this is most interesting is along the value of a differential equation, where we're following a differential equation from an old state to a new state, when we have a solution of any duration r that is satisfying the equation x prime equals f of x, when x prime at that time z along the solution actually is the time derivative of x at that moment in time z. But not only does x prime equals f of x hold true at every moment in time along the solution, but also the evolution domain constraint q does hold true at every moment in time. And also remember, there were some interesting subtleties about uh, us ignoring the initial value of the x prime variable, because otherwise, well, how would we follow x prime at that moment anyhow? We've also seen tools that will continue to be our most important tools. Um, for understanding how values change along a differential equation. The differential lemma that said that even if the meaning of a differential is defined in a different, namely spatial derivative kind of way, as a differential form ultimately, that at least if we happen to have a solution of a differential equation x prime equals f of x within an evolution domain constraint q for some positive duration and for every point in time in between, does the value of the differential, which is completely a syntactic expression, um, indeed equal the value of the time derivative that the value of e itself has as time is changing at that moment in time z that we were talking about. So the syntactic and analytic derivatives actually are equal along an ODE. We also saw the differential assignment lemma that along a solution of a differential equation x prime equals f of x, any property p is equivalent to the property p holding f where we assign the right-hand side of a differential equation f of x to the prime the variable x prime because, well, that's precisely one of the effects that the differential equation has on the prime symbols. And also, we saw the lemma of for derivations that are internalizing equations of differentials for example, e plus k prime is e prime plus k prime. Let's zoom in um, how we rendered them syntactically in proofs. The differential assignment lemma was captured as the differential effect axiom that says a property p always holds true after a differential equation if and only if the property holds true after additionally assigning x prime to be f of x after that differential equation, well, because that's precisely the effect that the differential equation x prime equals f of x has on the variable x prime, that it's supposed to be f of x at every moment in time. That directly internalizes the effect of that differential equations have on um, differential symbols. The derivations lemma were directly internalized syntactically as axioms that are equations of differentials. And the differential lemma, well, we so far internalize that only imperfectly, I would argue, as what happens for e equations of the shape E equals zero. But we will be able to do a lot more with the differential lemma plus the upper two as well. We've already seen a correctness proof for the differential lemma last time. We've also already seen a correctness argument, a very simple one, for the differential assignment lemma that's internalized in the differential effect axiom. Well, we haven't actually seen yet the correctness proof for the derivations lemma. So why are these axioms sound? Let's put that on a new slide. And how do we have to convince ourselves that these axioms are actually sound axioms. Well, for each and every one of them, we still have to do the exact same thing that we have to do for every other axiom to convince us that it's sound. We have to prove that each of its instances is valid, forming them, so meaning true in all states. Let's just do that for the first one. We fix a state omega, which is arbitrary, and then we ask, uh, when is an equation true in this state? Well, of course, that's true by the definition of the semantics whenever evaluating the left-hand side is equal to evaluating the right-hand side. Let's do just exactly that. The value of the left-hand side, well, that's the value of a differential term that happens to be e plus k, but never mind. The value of the differential term is the differential form corresponding to what we compute out of its spatial derivatives. So it is exactly the sum of all variables of the partial derivative of the value of the inner term, e plus k, by the spatial variable x, 
at the state omega, multiply it with the value of the co-state, so multiply it with the value of the differential variable or differential symbol x prime. You know, how does e plus k changes, x changes at the state that we're currently talking about, times how, according to the value of x prime, does apparently the variable x change at the moment. What can we do now? Um, well, we can look at this partial derivative and say um, it's a partial derivative of a value of something fa funny and crazy. How about we spell out by the semantics of what the value of plus is? That's, of course, the value of the left-hand side plus the value of the right-hand side, still in the same context of the partial derivatives and the valuation in omega. Then we can say it's a partial derivative of a sum now. You know, this was addition on the real numbers, and this just was a syntactic symbol that we happen to spell plus, which of course means exactly that. The partial derivative of an addition is of course the addition of the partial derivative, so it's the sum of the left partial derivative plus the right partial derivative at the same state that we're talking about by the same variable that we're talking about. Now, these we can distribute to get separately the left sum plus the right sum. I'll just multiply each of them by the value that x prime happens to have in the state omega and split it into separate sums. And then we remember that this is actually nothing else than the semantic value of how e changes. So the semantic value of the differential of e in the state omega. And that is precisely the semantic value of the differential of k in the state omega. Well, and that, of course, you know, by the very semantics of the plus operator is exactly the value that e prime plus k prime has in the state omega. But that now is precisely true for any arbitrary state omega. And on the left-hand side, we've evaluated the value of the left-hand side of this axiom. On the right-hand side, we've evaluated the value of the right-hand side of this axiom. Um, we've come out with a big equation that's saying, well, both of those values are the same under all circumstances in every state omega. Anyhow, in other words, we can believe in the soundness of this axiom from now on because we've just seen a proof. And likewise, can you do the proofs for the other axioms for differentials? Jointly, they enable us to apply the differential operator to anything. Here, for example, this tells us once and for all what the uh, differential of a sum is, but the other axioms told us what the differential of a product or a constant or a variable is. Here they are. The value of the differential of a sum, the value of the differential of a product, the value of the differential of a constant, the value of a differential of a variable. And each and every one of those times is not just the value of both sides equals of the equation actually true in every state, but also the right-hand side is structurally simpler because the differential operator is applied only to smaller terms, which by always rewriting from left to right, we keep on getting smaller and smaller, structurally simpler and simpler and simpler terms. Now we know how to axiomatically treat differentials. The differential effect axiom tells us what the effect of a differential equation is on the primed symbols, which, for example, can occur indirectly down here. But let's zoom in what the effect of a differential equation is on the evolution domain constraint. Here we go. Reminder, what is the effect of the evolution domain constraint? Well, it's the region that we can't leave ever. So if we're following a solution of a differential equation from an old state to a new state, we can never ever go so far as to ever go near a state, so to say. We can never actually go to a state where not q is true. We can only be in the parts of the region where q remains true at every moment in time as we're following the ODE. Well, and of course, in semantics, that precisely says the solution has to be a solution not just of the differential equation, but also of the evolution domain constraint. So q's got to be true at every moment in time along the solution. That, of course, enables us to read off differential equations by construction cannot leave their evolution domain constraints, which also means that any property P is going to be true after the differential equation if and only if the implication Q implies P is true after the differential equation because, well, of course Q holds true after the differential equation because 
it would hold true at every moment in time while following the differential equation, including at the end. And indeed, that is an if and only if, because while following a differential equation, x prime equals f of x within q, we already know that q is true, so we're not actually asking a different question here, except, of course, we do syntactically, which means this differential weakening axiom is a way for us to tease out the evolution domain constraint from a differential equation. Here we get it as an assumption, when here we didn't like formally have it as an assumption readily available, except when we first used the differential weakening axiom. Well, good. So the differential weakening axiom is an awesome axiom, but in and of itself it isn't super useful yet for proving anything at all, because still, you know, it's reducing a property about a differential equation to an admittedly easier property of a differential equation, but it's still a property of a differential equation. It requires us, instead of proving P is always true afterwards, to merely prove that P holds true if Q is still true. So Q implies P. That's a bit easier, but it's still an ODE. What can we do with ODEs, or for that matter, any other hybrid program that we don't currently have to want to worry about? We can generalize them away by Gödel's generalization proof rule. So indeed, let's use them for some good in this example, where we say um, this is zooming in on the bouncing ball and just the part of the proof that's worrying about the differential equation and the question where we're currently still above ground, not the question where we're below initial height. But this part of the question, right? remember? And for that, we really shouldn't want to solve the ODE to find out whether we're above ground if, I guess, by assumption, the evolution domain constraint we're above ground. Let's make that formally rigorous. So what we do here is apply the differential weakening axiom to replace the post condition that we've got by, you know, the evolution domain constraint implies the post condition. So here we go. We pull out the evolution domain constraint as an assumption. Then we use Gödel's generalization proof rule in order to make sure that we can get rid of this differential equation. So prove a post condition of a box by proving that post condition without any assumptions. So we need to prove that this property that came out of the evolution domain constraint implies zero is less or equal to x, and of course it does by trivial arithmetic or almost the identity principle actually. Observe there was no need to solve the ODEs, in particular the fact that we're still above ground if our evolution domain constraint tells us that we have to remain above ground holds without, you know, without considering the differential equation, holds for any differential equation bouncing balls, it was only interesting that they remained below initial height, and that required a lot of thought, but that they remained above ground, well, that's a given by construction. But now, we don't always want to have to do the you know, differential weakening followed by Gödel's generalization proof rule, da, 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 da. we want to just capture this and summarize it as a useful proof rule right from the get-go. That is the differential weakening proof rule which of course is doing the same kind of reasoning that the differential weakening axiom does by just saying one way of proving from a bunch of assumptions the property that always after running a differential equation within the evolution domain constraint Q, the post condition does hold true, is to simply show that it follows from the evolution domain constraint. The little dw and the big dw still follows our convention that Big capital letters are for big ideas, whereas the little ones are for gluing all the little reasoning principles together to make our lives you know, less complicated. So this also, if we just always worry back from the axioms, we will have big trouble using the big names and we will have little trouble using the little names because they're already summarized and rejected the right way for our purposes. But remember, the axiom is the way to understand what's really happening here. You can, of course, directly derive the differential weakening proof rule from the differential weakening axiom, just using this as a guiding example on how to do the proof. Now, remember what we've done in the previous chapter, where we worried about proving equational post conditions E equals zero of a differential equation using the differential invariance proof rule. Um, that derives directly from the differential invariant axiom for equations. 
together with the differential effect axiom, and now we even have the differential weakening axiom available, in order to worry actually about the question what happens with the evolution domain constraint, because last time, at that moment, we didn't take those into account. Let's understand that. So what does um, our differential linear axiom only told us that E equals zero always holds true after a differential equation, if and only if it's holds true right now, provided that we already know that E prime is zero always after the differential equation, meaning that relates to the rate of change of E. If the rate of change of E is always zero, then of course E is always zero after the ODE, if and only if it was already zero before the ODE. But where do evolution domain constraints into the picture? Well, if our differential equation has an evolution domain constraint, then, you know, I guess we should be able to have it here and also there. And I guess intuitively, uh, we should also be able to assume the evolution domain constraint when doing the proof that the value of the differential of E is zero, always after assigning the value of the right inside f of x to the differential symbol x prime and this discrete induction step for this continuous differential equation. Okay, let's convince ourselves that that's actually okay. Yes, we do get, you know, the evolution domain constraint in the places we expect it, but it's very interesting to note that we actually can also get it in the property that says it's true in the beginning. Why is that? Well, that's the case because if we assume that we already know, remember this is a backwards implication, which is just another way of saying this implies that, just written in backwards style. That if we assume that always after running this differential equation E prime equals zero is true, then E equals zero is always true after running the differential equation if and only if E equals zero was true. But hold on a second, there's another way how this could be true or because we simply start in a state where Q isn't true, because then it is vacuously true, but there is, there is no way of solving this differential equation, not even for time zero, and then we'd have no reason to believe that E equals zero would be true right now. That means, however, that E equals zero is still true after we're testing whether the evolution domain constraint holds true at the moment. That means, in other words, if we know that E prime is always zero, then we know that E itself is always zero after a differential equation with an evolution domain constraint, if and only if E equals zero is always true after surviving successfully the test whether the evolution domain constraint holds true. And of course, that also means the differential linear and proof rule. Now um, we should under try and understand why we exactly we get the evolution domain constraint here but that derives very easily out of these axioms that we have using the new differential weakening axiom along the way, as opposed to worrying about it flat from the get-go. So if you would like to prove what we have as a conclusion, then we can use the differential invariant axiom to say, um, because we have here in assumptions E equals zero, that certainly implies that E equals zero holds after the test Q, because whether the test passes or not, E equals zero does hold true here. Notice we could assume a bit more here, top secret. Um, and, and that would imp imply this, which is precisely what we're asking, if only we have a proof of that though. So the remaining question is whether always after the differential equation of the evolution domain constraint is the differential of E zero. Now, we can use the differential effect axiom to say any arbitrary post condition, for example, that one is true always after an ODE, if and only if it's true after we first assign the right hand side of the ODE to the left hand side of the ODE. Let's do precisely that. Here we go. We get out the fact that x prime is f of x afterwards. Remember, E prime, the differential of E, when we unroll that syntactically, will ultimately have a lot of occurrences of differential variables because, well, how it changes depends on how the individual variables change. It makes a ton of sense. But that means here we will ask the question at some point, what, how do the variables change? And by first using the differential effect axiom, we carry that knowledge around syntactically that X prime is apparently F of X. It's a sign to that. Now we use the differential weakening axiom to say any arbitrary post condition, for example, that one is true after an ODE if and only if it follows um, from the evolution domain constraint. So we can reduce it to this. And now 
we can use Gödel's generalization proof rule to say that one way of proving a prose condition is true always after running a differential equation uh, by ignoring the differential equation. But fortunately, here, if we get this as, an, as a flat pose condition we're trying to prove in isolation, by using the implies right proof rule, we do get the evolution domain constraint as one of our assumptions. And that is the remaining pose condition we're trying to prove, which is precisely what the differential invariant proof rule tells us. And yes, for understanding why this is correct, it's best to worry about the individual axioms, differential invariance, differential effects, differential weakening. And Remember, these are the foundational principles of reasoning behind it. But for actually doing concrete proofs, it can be much easier to use the differential invariant proof rule right away. Well, this sounds like a very useful reasoning principle. These work for any post conditions. But the differential invariant axiom does not yet. It's specific to equational post conditions. So let's make that more general next. Notice it was very important both that I used the differential weakening proof rule before using the Gödel generalization proof rule, because otherwise I wouldn't have had the evolution domain constraint readily available as an assumption right here. It's also very important that we've used the differential effects axiom before using the Gödel generalization proof rule, because otherwise we wouldn't have had the effect on the uh, differential symbol available in this proof, and we would have just failed horribly because you, there usually is no way at all to prove that the differential of an expression is zero without any extra knowledge about either how the diff values of the differential symbols is like or what the evolution domain constraints look like. Now, for everything that follows, we will be l able to use the differential weakening axiom in the exact same style that we've done here. And that means we've got, because we've got the differential weakening axiom once and for all, I will simply ignore that for now as we worry about more complicated post conditions and ultimately add it back in in exactly the same style as we did here. Likewise, the differential effect axiom is already prepared for much more general post conditions. Just the differential invariant axiom that needs more attention in order to be able to generalize this beyond E equals zero properties and thus generalize the differential invariant proof rule beyond E equals zero post conditions. Let's do that. The other thing we would possibly like to prove is an equation E equals K, where E and K are terms, not just this term always this is zero term. And of course, in order to have a chance to prove that, we have to assume that E equals K is true in the beginning. Uh, we basically only need to worry about what the induction step should be for the differential invariant proof rule to be useful and actually correct. Well, how would you convince yourselves that E equals K is always true after an ODE if and what's true in the beginning? Well, you can convince yourselves, for example, that the differential of E equals the differential of K, because that basically means if both of them have the same rate of change all the time, then you know I guess if they start equal, they're going to stay equal. And that directly follows from the differential invariant axiom for equational post conditions that says if you know that E prime equals K prime always after the differential equation, intuitively again they have the exact same rate of change, then E equals K is always true after a differential equation if and only if it is true right now. Remember we already talked about how we need to generalize this to sneaking post conditions in the exact same style that we did for E equals zero. Intuition simply is that we will be able to prove correctness of the differential invariant axiom for equations using the differential lemma. The lemma that says that, well, along a solution of a differential equation, the value of E prime, the differentials, is exactly the same as the time derivatives of the values of E. And, well, if we have two values that start the same and they have the same rate of change, then they're going to stay the same at any moment. Well, how we do that is, worry about the rate of change. There's a time derivative of the left-hand side that we have to worry about, which by the differential lemma is exactly the same as the value of E prime. But because we know always along the differential equation is the value of E prime the same as the value of K prime, since that is a solution, it also has to be the same as the value of K prime, so the differential of the term K. Well, but that again, but the differential lemma was the exact same thing as the time derivative of the value of K. And well, and that now means that the time derivative of the left-hand side, E, is equal to the time derivative of the right-hand side, K. And that means because that was the case that the time derivatives are equal, 
if they start equal, they stay equal, and vice versa. If they always stay equal, they must have started equal in that circumstance. Cool. Well, all right. Admittedly, we could have sort of seen that syntactically also from reducing the case whether e equals k to the case whether e minus k equals zero. And then we're formally in the previous case that we already understood. But, you know, it's not like you really literally want to do this on every use case. It's better to once understand how the effect of difference equations is on equations by the difference in their proof rule and its corresponding axioms. Well, the other thing that's good for is that we are now in a position to generalize this. We have a way of proving a formula is always true after in ODE by proving another property of a formula with derivatives in it that actually are just differentials and that we then relate in our soundness proofs to time derivatives. Now what would happen if you had E greater equal K here? Well then you need to assume E greater equal K for sure. What's the induction step you need to prove in that circumstance? Well, you can also just prove that E prime is greater equal K prime. Why? Well, because if E starts above K or equal, then E always stays above K or equal, if only its rate of change is above the rate of change of K or equal. Yeah, that makes sense. In axiom form, um, if we know that always after the ODE E prime is greater equal K prime, then always after the ODE, E greater equal K, if and only if E is greater equal K right now. So E is greater equal K at every time, if and only if it's true right now. And again, the correctness proof for the greater equal version of the differential engineering axiom is just, again, by alluding to the differential lemma that says, well, what I'm interested in apparently is the value of E and the value of K you know, along this ODE, so let's worry about the time derivative of E compared to the time derivative of k, the time derivative of e at any point in time by the differential lemma is the same as the value of the differential of e. But by that assumption, along the ODE, the differential of e is greater or equal to the differential of k along this solution of differential equation. Well, but again, by the differential lemma, the differential of k, of course, has the same value as the time derivative of k, and that means the time derivative of the left-hand side e is greater or equal the time derivative of the right-hand side k, and that means if it started with a value that's greater or equal, it's also going to stay with a value that's greater or equal at any moment, and vice versa as well. If it's always greater or equal k, and so is its rate of change, then of course e must have presently also been greater or equal k. Cool. Now what happens with in the case where this would be less or equal? Well, then we also have to prove that the rate of change is less or equal, obviously. If E starts below K, it always stays below K, um, if only its rate of change is below the rate of change of K. Right? So if we know that the rate of change of E is less or equal to the rate of change of K, because the differential of E is less or equal to the differential of K, always after following the differential equation, then, you know, the value of E is always less or equal to the value of K when following the differential equation, if and only if it is true right now that E is less or equal to K. Makes sense. Oh boy, is this working well. What if we had E greater than K as the thing we're trying to prove? Uh, of course, we have to assume that E is greater than K in the beginning, otherwise it isn't true all the time after the ODE, because it won't be true for duration zero solutions. What do we need to prove? Well, also that, right? Um, if E is greater than K in the beginning, then E is greater than K all the time, if only we prove that the rate of change of E is greater than the rate of change of K at every moment. So if we start above K, we always stay strictly above K, if the rate of change of E is always strictly above the rate of change of K. But actually, we can do a little better than that. You want to think about it in a moment? Well, sure. If 
we want to make sure that always after the difference equation e is greater than k, we have to demand that that's the case right now, that e is greater than k, because otherwise, well, we lose this after zero to mu and zero again. But we can get away with a little bit less of an assumption. I mean, it's sufficient if we simply assume that always after running x prime equals f of x is e prime greater or equal k prime. So even if e just has the same rate of change that k does, because it starts strictly above by this assumption, it also already stays strictly above, right? So starting at greater value with this, at least the same rate of change, or possibly more, will always get us to values that are above the values of k. Cool. Okay, and then, you know, similarly for less than, but it's kind of getting a bit boring, so how about not equal? If this is not equal, then we have to demand that it's a not equal in the beginning, and we have to demand that it's a not equal rate of change all the time, right? Because um, if we know that E doesn't start at K, then E will never be at K whenever uh, the rate of change of E is never the rate of change of K, as in this picture, right? So E doesn't start at K, so E doesn't end up like K because they never had the same rate of change. Actually, hold on a minute. That doesn't seem like it's very right. I mean, everything somehow followed from the mean value theorem, you know, um, in our proofs that, you know, used as major inside the differential lemma, but uh, not actually quite in this case, because here, you know, E and K start differently. They never have the same rate of change, and yet they still mean. They're not always different. In fact, in a certain sense, it's precisely because of the different rate of change that they have a chance of meeting each other when they start at different positions. So this, you know, no matter how tempting it will be, is not actually a sound axiom to adopt, which means we need to be very careful with what we're believing in. For axioms, we should do a very careful soundness proof in all those circumstances. Instead, um, by differentiarians, if you want to prove that E is never K, we need to, of course, assume that E is never K, but prove that the rate of change of E is equal to the rate of change of K, which follows from the differential axiom for disequalities, which also says you know, E is never K if and only if E isn't K right now, but they change in the same rate. This could sometimes be a bit conservative, right? Because there's also other reasons why E is never K if it starts different, with that the reason being that they always change in the same rate. It's also possible, for example, that E is never K because E starts above K, like in this example, but then say the rate of change of E is always above the rate of change of K, right? That, that would correspond to a different proof. That would correspond to a proof where we prove this by proving the different stronger property that E is greater than K if it starts greater than K, for example, and then we would have E prime greater or equal K prime to prove. That, that's just another way of combining the logical axioms that we've already seen. Just telling you that that can be sometimes useful. Let's make an example for this. Here's a difference equation and a property that we would like to prove is always true afterwards, which of course means we at least need to convince ourselves that it's true in the beginning, for example, by assuming that it's true in the beginning. And then, well, for example, this differential equation with this evolution of n constraint could start at this point and then follow the dynamics in x and y coordinate space, follow and follow and follow. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Indeed, if we start anywhere in this green region, then we always stay inside the green region. For example, for the solution here, which is following like that. It can't leave, but also if you would start somewhere else, it would stay in this ellipse. And we can also look at, for example, how the x and the y co variables are changing over time. And we'll see, you know, their values are both, you know, decaying over time. In other words, this is actually a damp oscillator. And without having to worry about what the solution would be, which is going to be more annoying, we can easily prove that the property is always true when we follow it, just by differential invariance reasoning. The values change, right? It's not just a differential invariant term argument where the values remain equal. You know, it's changing squares look like it's changing a whole lot. But 
still the inequality is preserved at all moments in time. Let's do the proof by differential engineering. Differential of the post condition is what we've got here. 2 omega square xx prime is, of course, what we get when we differentiate by the differential axioms omega square x square, because, hey, omega doesn't change in this LDV. Uh, plus differential of y square, that's 2yy prime. And that's what equals 0, because c doesn't change. And so, of course, c squared doesn't change either. And we leave around the discrete shadow of the differential equation, where we have the left-hand side of differential equation is signed to be the right-hand side of differential equation. Uh, and we have the evolution domain constraint available as assumptions here. And then we plug in for x and for y, like so. Get this math. 2 omega square xy plus 2y multiply the value of the right-hand side. Mm, now let's see. So... 2 omega square xy, well, that's nice. And here we get 2y times x times minus omega square. Well, mm, that uh, actually directly cancels this. That's kind of nice. Um, and then what else do we get? 2y with a minus sign, so minus 4y square d omega. But both d and omega were greater or equal to 0. And since we have minus... 4y squared, the whole thing is always less or equal to zero, which means the whole thing proves by rule of arithmetic, and it was a very simple four-line proof that did not require us to even know what the solution of these differential equations are, let alone try it out in infinitely many circumstances. Remember, for this proof, what was very important is that we actually know, for example, that the damping coefficient is greater than zero, which came out of the evolution of main constraint. We also need to know that omega is greater than zero at all moment, but that's not what I'm going to be using again later on. But the d greater than zero is what I will be using later again. Just keep that in mind for now. So we've covered differential engineering proof rule for all the atomic pose conditions, so formulas that can't be composed into simpler formulas, but of course there's other formulas remaining, for example. Conjunctions. How do we prove that A and B is always true after a differential equation? Well, for or, of course, we have to assume that A and B are true in the beginning, otherwise, uh, well, we've lost after zero time units. So what do we need to prove? In an inductive way, to make sure that A and B both remain true, if they are true in the beginning. Well... I guess we have to prove that both A as well as B always remain true as we're following the differential equation. And we've already got the formulas for the job. It's A prime and B prime, where A prime is already, you know, when A is, for example, greater or equal, we've already defined that. When B is, for example, less than, we've already defined that. In other words, we learned that if we worry about conjunctions of regions, for example, we're inside this conjunction, the right one, of you know, the distance is fine and we're slow enough or things like that, then we always satisfy the conjunction of the two if we make sure that we always satisfy one and we always satisfy the other, which means that if we know that always after the differential equation, both A prime and B prime are true, then A and B itself is always true after a differential equation, if and only if A and B is true right now. And we can prove that directly, just as derived reasoning principle. Why? Well, because one thing we can do is to prove a conjunction after a box by splitting the box with the box conjunction axiom, the distributivity law, the box is distributed over conjunctions, Always after running any arbitrary hybrid program alpha, for example, differential equation, is P and Q true, if and only if always after running alpha is P true, and independently always after running alpha is Q true. So let's use that here and already split um, by the and write proof rule onto separate branches and delete parts away that we don't actually currently need to get. Um, if A is true in the beginning, then X prime equals F of X satisfies A at all times. And if B, B is true in the beginning, then always after the following differential equation, do, does B hold? And on the left-hand side, we can prove this by the differential variant proof rule. 
or its axiom version to reduce this to the question whether a prime is true and to reduce this to the question whether b prime is true and that's precisely what we get back here because now if we ask this sub question and that sub question if i hadn't split it into separate proofs of course i would have been able to form the conjunction the true in other words that's the better proof you should look at in the textbook and of course the conjunction of the two we can repackage into a single box that we've got here, which will ultimately then also derive the differentiating proof rule. Okay, conjunctions of differentiating or con conjunctions of their invariance conditions. That sounds easy enough. For example, we can do that in order to prove that the bouncing ball is satisfying its invariant and is always above ground. That is a conjunction, but we can actually do this in a bit of a clever way here. We can split by the box conjunction principle this into separate arguments, whether we are above ground and whether the uh, left conjunct of the invariant is always true. And why do I do that instead of using the differential invariant proof rule for conjunctions? Well, because the right hand side we've already seen, and it's true for very easy reasons, have nothing to do with the ODE. Um, if we're always above ground by assumption of the evolution domain constraint, then I guess we're always above ground. So that's going to be very easy to prove, which means only this one is remaining as a question. And here we use differential invariants to drive the post condition, which gives us 2gx prime equals, well, that's constant, so that goes away, minus v squared, and we've derived that, we get minus 2vv prime. We plug in here and there to get this. 2gv is minus 2v minus g. Well, that's trivial arithmetic. Of course, 2gv is also minus minus 2vg. So that proves very easily. And the right-hand side proves just by the differential weakening principle to get the evolution domain constraint out. And then the identity principle proves it. In other words, it's always useful to pay attention to what's the most succinct proof for something. It's also worth noting that we now as a building block, have a proof of the bouncing ball property, which if we embed this as the only thing that had to worry about the French equations in the bouncing ball safety argument, that is entirely without using the solution axiom. It is, thanks to differential invariance, and yeah, differential weakening, possible to prove properties of systems, even if we could solve them. Moreover, notice solving this differential equation x prime equals v and v prime equals minus g, we would ultimately have integrated the system to get the solution. And we would have plucked the so integrated solution in to the post condition, which would have increased all kinds of degrees and made the reasoning very complicated. By contrast, because we worry about differential invariance here, we derive it and that lowers the degrees and makes everything easier. It's just a very simple local argument with almost no arithmetic we have to do here. It's much easier to pr do proofs this way around. It's also important to notice that whenever we have questions where post conditions are true for I different reasons, I guess it's a good idea to split them and worry about these questions separately. That was the conjunction case. You know, a conjunction is always true after an ODE, if and only if it's true right now. And the conjunction of this differential invariance is true always. Here's the proof rule. What do we do if it's a disjunction instead? Well, then, of course, we need to just assume the disjunction of the two. And what do we do with the um, induction step? Well, like that, right, if we want to show that um, you know, our distance is good or we're slow enough, one of the two, then it suffices to convince ourselves that you know, or A or B is true in the beginning uh, to show that A or B is true all the time. Um, if we show that always after following the differential equation, A prime or B prime holds true. So the differential of A holds or the differential of B holds. And so that would be the proof rule corresponding to that. Well, it might make some sense, but uh, hold on a second there. Um, what could go wrong is that we, you know, this disjunction is true because A is true in the beginning, but that disjunction is true because B prime is true all the time. And then, you know, A would have been true in the beginning, but B is the one that's inductive, and of course that doesn't fit together. It's got to be the same one that's true in the beginning and actually inductive. And this proof rule does not capture that correctly. It is an unsound proof rule. Please don't adopt it. Instead, 
what is perfectly fine is if you show that the disjunction of the two is true in the beginning and the conjunction of both of them is inductive, so both of them are inductive and one of them is true in the beginning, then do we know that the disjunction of the two is going to be true all the time. In fact, you know, often you'll be able to do more effective proofs by just going for an inductive proof for the one that happens to be inductive and not for both of them. But we can again derive this just syntactically by, for example, showing that A or B is an assumption. We split the disjunction by the or left proof rule into its two separate cases, which essentially informs us for the rest of the proof that what we would like to do if we know A is use the monotonicity principle to prove that A also is in true always afterwards. And of course, if we know A is always true, then we also do know that A or B is always true, which was the question because you know, that's just simple propositional logic. And on this side, we prove that if A is true in the beginning, it's true all the time by asking said whether you know, its differential formula A prime is always true after the ODB. And then you know, we can continue like so. Likewise, on the other side, if we assume in this case that B is true in the beginning, then we show that A or B is true all the time by showing that B is true all the time instead. And of course, B implies that A or B is true by simple propositional logic again. And this question, we now prove that if B is true in the beginning, it's true all the time by reducing it to a question about its differential formula. And that, of course, also argues again that, well, but if we now have that A prime is true and that B prime is true, we also have that A prime and B prime is true after the ODE by, again, the box and splitting principle. Well, what I've done wrong so far is, you know, in the proof rules we've looked at, we had you know, the evolution domain constraint Q is an assumption in the induction step where we prove that F prime is true after assigning the right-hand side of the ODE to the left-hand side. But, yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, we should have really kept F itself around as well because, come on, that's what you do in the loop induction proof rule as well, right? You would show that always after running a loop, F is true by showing that F is true in the beginning, just like up here. And, of course, in the induction step, you assume that F is true in order to prove that F is true after having run alpha and you. I should have assumed it like that. That is a useful proof rule because, you know, we can prove more stuff with it. Of course, if we're proving that f is inductive, we should be assuming that f is still actually true. So let's try this out. For example, just v squared minus 2v plus 1 is 0. Here's the differential equation. It's true again afterwards. Let's use this proof rule, which reduces this to the question whether, you know, v squared, that gives us 2vv prime minus 2v prime, and that drops out, is 0. Now we put in the left-hand side of the ODE for the right-hand side of the ODE. We do get 2VW minus 2W, and 2VW minus 2W is 0 if V squared minus 2V plus 1 is 0, because that means V is 1, and so here's a proof for the entire arithmetic. Okay, that's great, and here's a picture of it. Um, we assume that we started V squared minus 2V plus 1 is 0 here, and then always when we're following the dynamics, uh, v squared minus 2v plus 1 is 0. Great. Not so great because it isn't actually a true statement down there. We should never have a proof of something that isn't also a valid formula because that would ruin soundness. Indeed, this proof rule, which is often suspected to be a correct proof rule and has been often claimed in the literature to be a correct reasoning principle, is actually an unsound reasoning principle. The reason is, well, we cannot assume formulas in their own inductive proof, just like we do in discrete systems. Well, because differential equations are more subtle, right? We're in the middle of a proof where we worry about ultimately derivatives and so on. But we only know that F is true in a single isolated state, and in that single isolated state, we can't do derivative arguments to convince ourselves that it's true again. It's too cyclic in discrete loops we can because there's literally a separation between F being true right now and then F being true in the next step but next step arguments don't work so well for differential equations. So make sure we do this more carefully. So let's instead, if only we had more assumptions in our evolution domain constraints, then we would also correctly have more assumptions in our differential invariance proofs. Let's put more assumptions in our evolution domain constraints using the fundamental principle of differential cuts, which is generalizing thoughts by Gerhard Gensen's cut principle from discrete logic to differential equations logic in a very unforeseen way. So if we would like to ask a question about a differential equation, for example, whether f is invariant, then one thing we can do with it is to prove something else. 
is always true after the ODE, and then assume it from that one. So we prove that something else, a property C, is always true after we're following a differential equation. When we're starting in the same kinds of states. And having done so, well, from now on, we might as well assume that C is true because, well, we just proved it is. And if we assume that it's true, it's actually true all the time as we're following the differential equation. So we can assume it in the middle of the evolution domain constraint because we cannot ever leave the region where C is true and starting in F anyhow. Well, that's like, in order to prove that F is true, we prove that something else is true, and then assume that there's something else is true. We prove the lemma and assume the lemma for the rest of the proof, except now the way we assume it is at every moment in time along the differential equations. It's a bit more complicated, but it's a way of editing evolution domain constraints, this differential cut principle. Of course, if we do that starting out with a differential equation that already has an evolution domain constraint, what happens then? Well, then I guess we get to assume it over here because, well, that's what we already assumed that the differential equation can't leave, but we also continue to be able to assume it over there. So that means if we have always after following x prime equals f of x within q is f true, then here it suffices to prove that C is true all the time as we follow the ODE within Q. And over here, we have the evolution domain constraint assumptions that we are within Q and C. In order to prove that F is true. Notice this is how the parentheses, of course, go. That means essentially we're proving that we never enter this red region here. So C is everything outside. And that means we also can just assume not to have gone there, we can cut it out of the state space. That is a principle that can be helpful repeatedly. We might be able to do that again, because after we convince ourselves that we never go down there, maybe we can also convince ourselves that we never go up there. So again, by the differential cut principle, cut it out of the state space. Now, we look at the remaining state space and say that no wonder our system is safe, because, well, we ran out of unsafe bad blue regions. And that formally is a way of appealing to the differential weakening principle after we've just augmented our evolution domain constraint with more and more and more and more knowledge of properties we first proved. So we first proved that we can't go there before we assumed that we can't go there. Think of it this way. If you're proving a property about your robot, it's useful to first prove that your robot doesn't leave the road. And from that on, you can assume that your robot is always on the road in order to worry about whether it collides with other cars. That makes this question easier because there's more that you can assume. Let's do a soundness argument for this differential cut principle right away. And it is really the same principle of how I write it down as a proof rule or as an axiom. So let's just do it once for this version. If we have a solution of a differential equation within Q, which is what we're asking here, well, that is starting in a state where f is true, which is what we're asking here, then because this premise is valid, we also know that, at least in this state, for example, it is always true, since we're starting in f, that c is always true f of the ODE. Well, but since that is one of the solutions of exact same that ODE, it also means that C is always true afterwards, but that means the solution we had wasn't just a solution of X prime equals F of X and Q, it was even a solution of X prime equals F of X and Q and C. Well, that means it's one of those solutions that we have here, and that means after all of those solutions starting from a state where F is true, well, omega is one of them, do we need know that F is true afterwards? And that, of course, means that at the end of the solution, if we call the duration R, uh, the state phi of R is F true, which is precisely that question right here. So it's actually very easy to convince ourselves of the soundness of the differential cut principle. But it is very impactful because it enables us to augment the evolution domain constraint by first proving that we can't leave the augmented version of it. Let's make use of that. For example, by looking at an increasingly damping oscillator. So a damped oscillator as before that now has the damping coefficient changing in well, the only stupid way I could think of that still fits on the slide, by changing it along d prime equals 7. Well, and now remember the proof that we had before by differential variance won't work because the inductiveness of this will, remember, depend on whether d is greater than equal to 0. But we don't know whether d is greater than equal to 0. It's not in our evolution domain constraint. If only we could put it there somehow which is what 
it seems like differential cuts were made for. So if we have a, an evolution of the system, we all still always stay within the green region if we start in the green region, right? Uh, even if our damping is increasing, so we're damping stronger and stronger and stronger, so we're spiraling in a bit quicker than we used to before. But in this increasingly damp oscillator, we would love to know that d is greater equal to zero all the time. So if we had it in the evolution of main constraint, our old proof would work. But how can we put it there only by first asking whether d greater equal zero is always true of the ODE? So if it's true in the beginning, it's true afterwards. How do we prove that? In this case, we could like solve the ODE because the relevant part of it is actually easy, d prime equals seven. But who still solves ODEs these days? Come on, we'll just do a differential invariant proof. D prime greater than zero is the remaining sub question. Well, D prime is seven, so we put seven in, and seven is greater than zero as far as I know, so real arithmetic proves this. So after we've asked whether D is greater than zero, a differential cut comes back with the answer that yes, indeed, it is greater than zero. And uh, we know that the entire new and improved evolution domain constraint omega greater than zero and D greater than zero is readily available in the differential invariance proof up here. So as we are you know, deriving the post condition, we still get two omega squared x, x prime plus two y, y prime less or equal zero. And we put in the right hand side of the ODE for the left hand side of the ODE, and we get the arithmetic that still works out because, um, because the assumption d greater than zero, along together with omega greater than zero, which we never touched, is now available. Now we have a proof. Uh, well, actually, we only almost have a proof. Can you spot a slight problem? Well, we do at this moment of the proof know that d is greater than zero always after the ODE if it's true before, so we can sneak it into the evolution domain constraint, but we still need to convince ourselves that it is even true in the beginning. Do we have that among our assumptions? No, we don't. And of course, the property also isn't true if we start out with negative damping coefficients. Even if it keeps on increasing, the initial damping could you know, make this property false, even if it wasn't false, which means this d greater than zero actually needs to make it into the assumption for the initial state. I just didn't have space to put it. Besides, it's a good exercise to think about it for yourself and notice whether it, that is was necessary to assume this, as the proof is telling us. Also notice, here, one differential cut helped us prove this property, but sometimes it could be necessary to do multiple differential cuts in a row, where you keep on augmenting your knowledge about the system with more and more and more invariants until the questions become easy enough to prove. Another example for a differential cut, we would like to prove that x cubed is greater than minus 1, uh, which we assume is true in the beginning, but the problem is that x changes with y, so unless we know something about y, we will never be able to prove this because, well, the differential of that will mention y, and we won't know anything about y. So instead, let's prove something about y. For example, that the thing we already know is always true afterwards. So let's prove that y power 5 is greater than 0 is always true, which will give us 5y uh, to the 4 y prime, where we plug in um, the values of the trench equation, which will give us 5 y power 4 times y power 2, and that is 5 y power 6, which is really greater than 0 all the time. So that arithmetic proves. Here we have the assumption that we needed in order to even ever get there, so we can now put inside the evolution domain constraint the knowledge that y power 5 greater than 0 is always true. And you know, just for fun, I weakened away the assumption um, that y power 5 was greater than 0 in the beginning. Not necessary, but we don't need it anymore now. And you know, that was the proof down there. So from now on, we have this readily available and can do a straight out differential invariance proof to show that this follows by induction. So derivative of this is 2x squared x prime greater than 0, but we do get the evolution of main constraint, the new one that we used to not have here yet as an assumption. And so if we plug in this here, we do get uh, that value. And 2x squared times the power 4, well, that's always greater than 0. That's easy to see. 
but even if the 2x squares are always greater than zero, y power 5 doesn't have to be greater than zero, but it is because that's precisely what our evolutional main constraint said. So we now have a easy differential cut proof for soundness. Let's recall in more detail the greater or equal case for the differential invariant x. And we've seen subtleties in the differential invariant argument, so we should really convince us about the most fundamental base case. We've seen equations already, but we haven't seen inequalities yet. So, the differential invariant axiom for the inequality case, here in a simplified version, just to make our argument simpler for the slide, says that e is greater than zero all the time, if and only if e is greater than zero right now, provided we already know that the differential of e is greater than zero always after the ODE, which means the rate of change of e is non-negative. So we know if that means if e is starting greater than zero, it will always stay greater than zero. If its rate of change is greater than zero, it keeps increasing. Okay, let's you know introduce a function that I call h of time, which is the value that the solution that we're following here has at time t for the value of the term e that we care about. And that is a differentiable function on the interval from 0 to r. Well, if only there actually is a, a non-singleton interval, so if the duration is positive by the differential lemma. Uh, you were separately about the case, what happens if the duration is 0? It needs to be done, but I don't want to give it away for you now. Well, and the differential lemma also tells us that the time derivative, which of course doesn't exist in duration 0, the time derivative of this function, which is just a time derivative of, of uh, what the function is expanded, the value of e for the solution at time t, overall at time z is of course the same as the value of the e prime term at time z. Well, but the value of the e prime term at time z by this assumption along a solution of a differential equation of course is greater than zero, and that means the derivative, time derivative of this function is greater than zero at all times, but it also starts greater than zero, right? So the value that it has at time r, the end of it, the one we care about, minus the value that it used to have in the beginning, which is greater than zero, is by the mean value theorem, uh, the difference between the two time points, r minus zero, times some intermediate derivative, so some derivative for some time psi that happened in between zero and r, of the time derivative, but wait, all of those time derivatives were greater than zero, so whatever point in time is chosen by the mean value theorem here, it's going to have to have a value greater than zero, because that one has a value greater than zero, that has a value greater or equal zero, the whole thing is at least greater than zero, and that means hr is, you know, a value greater than zero plus another value greater than zero, which makes hr have a value greater than zero, which is precisely what we conjectured here. So the differential engineering axiom is sound, at least for the e greater than zero case, and the other cases work sort of like that. Let's summarize what we've seen today. We've seen the simple but useful differential weakening principle that says one way of proving a property of a differential equation is to prove that it follows directly from the evolution domain constraint. That's very powerful, but of course, doesn't help us if the property's truth depends on what the differential equation is doing. The differential invariant principle proves that a formula f is always true after an ODE if it was true before by proving that its differential f prime is true, assuming the evolution domain constraint when we cast the discrete shadow of differential equation, so we assign the right-hand side of the differential equation to the left-hand side of the differential equation by discrete assignment. If we're able to prove that the differential of f is always true within the evolution domain constraint, then it also always remains true if it was starting true. And the differential cut principle that says that you know, another way of proving properties of a differential equation is to first prove something else, prove that we're never leaving c, and then assume that we are not leaving c, which we just proved a moment ago. Remember, the differential weakening, differential invariant, differential cut principle actually follow from the differential weakening, differential invariant, differential cut axiom, but in just very straightforward ways. It's easier to prove these more fundamental ones sound and then derive these proof rules syntactically that bundle up the axioms in, in useful ways. We've seen today a very important induction principle for differential equations that enables us to prove much more complicated 
impose conditions, arbitrary logical formulas, basically, to be always true after a differential equation. 